Not Just a Witch by Eva Ibbotson. One. When people quarrel, it is bad, but when witches quarrel, it is terrible. Hecky was an animal witch. This didn't mean, of course, that she was a witch who was an animal. It meant that she did animal magic. Her full name was Hecate Tembury Smith, and she had started when she was still a child turning the boring noses of her mother's friends into interesting whiskery snouts or covering the cold ears of traffic wardens with thick black fur. She was a kind girl and only wanted to be helpful but when she gave the swimming bath attendant red spots and a fishy tail so that he could pretend to be a trout if he wanted to, her parents sent her away to a well-known school for witches. It was a school for making good witches. The motto the girls wore on their blazers said, witches against wickedness. And the headmistress was choosy about whom she took. Hecky was very happy there. She made a lot of friends, but her best friend was a stone witch called Dora Maybury. Dora wasn't made of stone, but she could turn anything into stone. When Dora was still in her high chair, she had looked at a raspberry jelly out of her round little eyes and it turned into something you couldn't cut up even with a carving knife. And when she started turning toothpaste solid in its tube and filling the fridge with statues of pork chops, she too was sent away to school. It takes 30 years to train a witch. And during all that time, Hecky and Dora were friends. Hecky was tall and thin with frizzy hair, pop eyes and teeth, which stuck out, giving her an eager look. Dora was squat and solid and had muscles like a footballer because it's heavy work dealing in stone. They shared their secrets and got each other out of scrapes. And at night in the dormitory, they talked about how they were going to use their magic to make the world a better place. By this time, Hecky could change any person into whatever animal she pleased by touching him with her knuckle of power. Though for the best result, she liked to use her toe of transformation also. And Dora could turn anybody into stone by squinting at him out of her small round eyes. And then, when they had been friends for 30 years, Hecky and Dora quarrelled. It happened at the graduation party where all the witches were to get their diplomas and get ready to go out into the world. The party, of course, was very special. And both Hecky and Dory went, Dora went separately to the hat shop kept by a milliner witch and ordered hats. Obviously, a witch on the most important day of her life is not going to turn up in a straw hat trimmed with daisies or a bonnet threaded with sky blue lace. Hecky thought for a long time and then she ordered a hat made of living snakes. The snakes were mixed. The crown of the hat was made of ribbon snakes, most delicately woven. Edging the brim were king snakes, striped in red and black and a single black mamba coiled in the shape of a bow, hung low over Hecky's forehead. Hecky tried it on and it looked lovely. The snakes hissed and spat and shimmered. The flickering tongues made the hat marvellously alive. Snake hats are not only beautiful, they're useful. When you take them off, you just put them in a tank and feed them a few dead mice and a boiled egg or two, and they last for years. The day of the party came, Hecky put on her bat skin robe, fixed a bunch of black whiskers onto her chin and lowered the hat carefully onto her curls. Then she set off across the lawn to the tent where the refreshments were. But what should happen then? Coming towards her was her friend Dora and she was wearing exactly the same hat. 
It wasn't roughly the same. It was exactly the same. The same ribbon snakes heaving and hissing on the crown. The same king snakes writhing round the brim. The same poisonous mamba tied into a bow. The two witches stopped dead and glared at each other. And the other witches stood round to see what would happen. How dare you copy my hat, cried Hecky. She was really dreadfully upset. How could Dora, who was her best friend, hurt her like this? But Dora was just as upset. How dare you copy my hat, she roared, sticking out her jaw. I chose this hat first. I'm an animal witch. It is my right to wear a hat of living snakes. Oh, really? I suppose you've heard of my great, great, great grandmother, who was a gorgon and had serpents growing from her scalp. It is my right to wear living snakes. But showing off about your relatives never works. Hecky only became angrier. The only thing you've got a right to wear on your head is a bucket, she shrieked. This was how the quarrel started. But soon the witches were throwing all sorts of insults at each other. They bought up old grudges. The time Dora had turned Hecky's hot water bottle to cement so that Hecky woke up with her stomach completely squashed. The time Hecky borrowed three warts from Dora's makeup box and got cocoa on them. From shouting at each other, the witches went on to tug at each other's hats. Dora tugged a ribbon snake out of Hecky's brim and how it hung it on a laurel bush. Hecky pulled at the end of Dora's black mamba and undid the bow. And all the time they screamed at each other as though they were sport little brats, not respectable middle-aged witches. Ten minutes later, both their hats were in ruins and a friendship which had lasted all their school days was over. The witches had planned to go and live close together in the same town. They were each going to buy a business where they could earn their living like ordinary ladies, but all their spare time would be spent in doing good. Now Hecky went by herself to the town of Wellbridge, but Dora went off to a different town. It was without her best friend, therefore, that Hecky began to try and make the world a better place. Chapter two. It was a boy called Daniel who found out that a witch had come to live in Wellbridge. He found out the night he went to babysit for Mr. and Mrs. Boothroyd at the Towers. Mr. Boothroyd owned a factory on the edge of the town which made bath plugs and he was very rich. Unfortunately, he was also very mean and so was his wife. As for his baby, which was called Basil, it was quite the most unpleasant baby you could imagine. Most babies have something about them which is all right. The ones that look like shriveled chimpanzees often have nice fingernails. The ones that look like half-baked buns often smile very sweetly. But Basil was an out-and-out -out disaster. When Basil wasn't screaming, he was kicking. When he wasn't kicking, he was throwing up his food. And then when he wasn't doing that, he was holding his breath and turning blue. Daniel was really too young to babysit, and so was Sumi, who was his friend. But Sumi, whose parents had come over from India to run the grocery shop in the street behind Daniel's house, was so sensible and so used to minding her three little brothers that the Boothroyds knew she would be fit to look after Basil while they went to the town hall to have dinner with the Lord Mayor. What's more, they knew they would have to pay her much less than they would have to pay a grown-up for looking after their son. And Sumi had suggested that Daniel came along. I'll ask you your spelling, she said, because she knew how cross Daniel's parents got when he didn't do brilliantly at school. Daniel's parents were professors, both of them. His father was called Professor Trent, and if only Daniel had been dead and buried in some interesting tomb somewhere, the professor would have been delighted with him. He was an archaeologist who studied ancient tribes and in particular their burial customs and he was incredibly clever. 
but Daniel wasn't mummified or covered in clay, so the professor didn't have much time for him. Daniel's mother, who was also called Professor Trent, was a philosopher who had written no less than seven books on the meaning of meaning, and she, was, and she too was terribly clever and found it hard to understand that her son was just an ordinary boy who sometimes got his sums wrong and liked to play football. The house they lived in was tall and grey and rather dismal and looked out across the river to the university where both the professors worked and to the zoo. As often as not when Daniel came home from school there was nobody there. Just notes propped against a teapot telling him what to unfreeze for supper and not to forget to do his piano practice. When you know you're a disappointment to your parents, your childhood, your school friends become very important. Fortunately, Daniel had plenty of these. There was Joe, whose father was a keeper in the Wellbridge Zoo, and Henry, whose mother worked as a chambermaid in the Queen's Hotel. And there was Sumi, who was so gentle and so clever and never showed off, even though she knew the answers to everything. And because it was Sumi who asked him, he went along to babysit at the Towers. The Boothroyd's house was across the river in a wide tree-lined street between the university and the zoo. They had been quite old when Basil was born and they dressed him like babies were dressed years ago. Basil slept in a bar barred cot with a muslin canopy and, a and blue bows. His pillow was edged with lace and he had a silken quilt. And there he sat in a long white night dress steaming away like a red and angry boil. The Boothroyds left Sumi and Daniel settled down on the, on the sitting room sofa. Sumi took out the list of spellings. Separate, she said, and Daniel sighed. He was not very fond of separate, but it didn't matter because at that moment, Basil began to scream. He screamed as though he was being stuck all over with red hot skewers and by the time they got upstairs he had turned an unpleasant shade of puce and was banging his head against the side of the cot. Sumi managed to gather him up. Daniel ran to warm his bottle under the tap. Sumi gave it to him and he bit off the teat. Daniel ran to fetch another. But um, Basil took a few windy gulps then swivelled round and knocked the bottle out of Sumi's hand. It took a quarter of an hour to clean up the mess. And by the time they got downstairs again, Sumi had a long scratch across her cheek. Separate, she said wearily, picking up the list. S, E, P, began Daniel, and was wondering whether to try an A or an E when Basil began again. This time, he had been sick all over the pillow. Sumi fetched a clean pillowcase and Basil took a deep breath and filled his nappy. She managed to change him, kicking and struggling and put on a fresh one. Basil waited till it was properly fastened, squinted and filled it again. It went on like this for the next hour. Sumi never lost her patience, but she was looking desperately tired. And Daniel, who knew how early she got up each day to mind her little brothers and help tidy the shop before school, could gladly have murdered Basil Boothroyd. At eight o'clock, they gave up and left him. Basil went on screaming for a while and then, miracle of miracles, he fell silent. But when Daniel looked across at Sumi for another dose of spelling, he saw that she was lying back against the sofa cushions. Her long dark hair streamed across her face and she was fast asleep. Daniel should now have felt much better. Sumi was asleep. There was no need to spell separate and Basil was quiet. And for about 10 minutes, he did. Then he began to worry. Why was Basil so quiet? Had he choked? Had he bitten his tongue out and bled to death? Daniel waited a little longer. Then he crept upstairs and stood listening by the door. Basil wasn't dead. He was snoring. 
Daniel was about to go downstairs again when something about the noise that Basil was making caught his attention. Basil was snoring, but he was snoring nicely. Daniel couldn't think of any other way of putting it. It was a cosy, snuffling snore, and it surprised Daniel because he didn't think that Basil could make any noise that wasn't horrid. Daniel put his head round the door, took a few steps into the room, and stopped dead. At first, he simply didn't believe it. What had happened was so amazing, so absolutely wonderful, that it couldn't be real. Only, it was real. Daniel blinked and rubbed his eyes and shook himself, but it was still there, curled up on the silken quilt. Not a screaming, disagreeable baby, but the most enchanting bulldog puppy with a flat, wet nose, a furrowed forehead and a blob of a tail. Daniel stood looking down at it, feeling quite light-headed with happiness, and the puppy opened its eyes. They were the colour of licorice and brimming with soul. There are people who say that dogs don't smile. But people who say that are silly. The bulldog grinned. It sat up and wagged its tail. It licked Daniel's hands. Oh, I do so like you, said Daniel to the little wrinkled dog. And the dog liked Daniel. He lay on his back so that Daniel could scratch his stomach. He jumped up to try and lick Daniel's face. But his legs were too short and he collapsed again. Daniel had longed and longed for a dog to keep him company in that tall grey house to which his parents came back so late. Now it seemed like a miracle, finding this funny, loving, squash-looking little dog in place of that horrible baby. Because Basil had gone. There was no doubt about it. He wasn't in the cot and he wasn't under it. He wasn't anywhere. Daniel searched the bathroom, the other bedrooms. Nothing. Someone must have come in and taken Basil and put the little dog there instead. A kidnapper? Someone wanting to hold Basil to ransom? But why leave the little dog? The Boothroids might not be very bright, but they could tell the difference between their baby and a dog. I must go and tell Sumi, he thought, and it was only then that he became frightened, seeing what was to come. The screaming parents, the police, the accusations. Perhaps they'd be sent to prison for not looking after Basil properly. And where was Basil? He might be an awful baby, but nobody wanted him harmed. Daniel tore himself away from the bulldog and studied the room. How could the kidnappers have got in? The front door was locked, so was the back, and the window was bolted. He walked over to the fireplace. It was the old-fashioned kind with a wide chimney. But that was ridiculous. Even if the kidnappers had managed to come down it, how could they have got the baby off the roof? Then he caught sight of something spilled in the empty grate. A yellowish, coarse powder like breadcrumbs. He scooped some up, felt it between his fingers, put it to his nose. Not breadcrumbs, goldfish food. He knew because the only pet his parents had allowed him to keep was a goldfish he'd won in a fair. And it had died almost at once because of fungus on its fins. And he knew too where the goldfish food came from. The corner pet shop, two streets away from his house. The old man who kept it made it himself. It had red flecks in it and always smelled very odd. Daniel stood there and his forehead was almost as wrinkled as the little dog's, for the pet shop had been sold a week ago to a queer looking woman. Daniel had seen her moving about among the animals and talking to herself. She'd been quite alone, just the sort of woman who might snatch a baby to keep her company. He'd read about women like that taking babies from their prams while their mothers were inside a supermarket. The police usually caught them. They weren't so much evil as crazy. Daniel gave the puppy a last pat and went downstairs. Sumi was still asleep, one hand trailing over the side of the sofa. 
For a moment, he wondered whether to wake her. Then he let himself very quietly out of the house and began to run. Chapter three. He ran across the bridge, turned into Park Avenue where his house was, then plunged into the maze of small streets that led between the river and the marketplace. Soon his parents' shop was in one of these and close by on the corner was the pet shop. Daniel had been inside it often when the old man owned it, but now he stood in front of it, badly out of breath and very frightened. It was dusk. The street lamps had just been lit and he could see the notice above the door. Under new management, it said, proprietor, Miss H. Tembury Smith. There was no one downstairs. The blinds were drawn, but upstairs he could see one lighted window. Daniel put his hand up to ring the bell and dropped it again. His knees shook, his heart was pounding. Suddenly it seemed to him that he was quite mad coming here. If the woman in the shop had taken Basil, she was certainly not going to hand him over to a schoolboy. She was much more likely to kidnap him too, or even murder him so that he couldn't tell the police. He was just turning away, ready to run for it, when the door suddenly opened and a woman stood in the hallway. She was tall, with frizzy hair, and looked brisk and eager like a hockey mistress in an old-fashioned girls' school. And she was smiling. Come in, come in, said Miss Tembury Smith. I've been expecting you. Daniel stared at her. But, 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 but how, he stammered. I mean, I've, I've come. I know why you've come, dear boy. You've come to thank me. How people can say that children nowadays are not polite, I cannot understand. I expect you'd like some tea. Quite stunned by all this, Daniel followed her through the dark shop with its rustlings and squeakings and up a narrow flight of stairs. Miss Tembury Smith's flat was cosy. A gas fire hissed in the grate. There were pictures of middle-aged ladies in school blazers and on the mantelpiece a framed photograph with its face turned to the wall. Unless you'd rather have fruit juice, she went on. And as Daniel continued to stare at her, you're admiring my dressing gown. It's pure bat skin. A thousand bats went into its making. And in case you're wondering, every single one of those bats died in its sleep. I would never, never wear the skin of an animal that had not passed away peacefully from old age. Never. But now Daniel felt he had to get to the point. Actually, it's about the Boothroyd baby that I've come, he said urgently. Well, of course it is, dear boy. What else? said Miss Tembury Smith. You're quite certain that tea would suit you? Yes, tea would be fine. Only please, Miss Tembury Smith, my friend is in such trouble. We're babysitting and the Boothroyds are due back any minute and there'd be such a row. So could you possibly give Basil back just this once? Give him back? Give him back? Her voice had risen to an outraged squeak. Well, you swapped him, didn't you? You kidnapped him. But Daniel's voice trailed away, suddenly uncertain. Miss Tembury Smith put down the teapot. Her slightly protruding eyes had turned stony. Her eyebrows rose. I kidnapped Basil Boothroyd, she repeated, stunned. Her long nose twitched and she looked very sad. I was so sure we were going to be friends, Daniel, she said. And he looked up, amazed that she should know his name. And now this, she sighed. Now listen carefully. When you have kidnapped somebody, you have got him. You agree with that? He is with you. He's part of your life. Yes. And would you imagine that a person in their right mind would want to have Basil even for five minutes? Or are you suggesting that I'm not in my right mind? No, no, but I came to Wellbridge to do good, Daniel. It's my mission in life to make the world a better place. She tapped the side of her long nose. It hurts, you know, to be misunderstood. So you didn't swap Basil for the little dog? Swapped him? 
Of course I didn't swap him. Oh, I'd so hope that you'll be my friend. I'm really very fond of boys with thin faces and big eyes. Some people would say your ears are on the large side, but personally I like large ears. But I can't be doing with a friend who is stupid. I want to be your friend, said Daniel, who did indeed want it very much. But I don't understand. You're... are you? Yes, of course I see. You're a witch. Miss Tembury Smith began to pour out the tea, but she had forgotten the tea bags. Well, I'm glad you see something, she said, but the point is, I'm not just a witch. I'm a witch who means to make the world a better place. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen a kangaroo throwing a bomb into a supermarket, killing little children? No, I haven't. Good. Have you ever seen an anteater hijack an aeroplane? No. Or a hamster go round knocking old ladies on the head and stealing their handbags. Have you ever seen a Koshin hamster? No. Exactly. It's very simple. Animals are not wicked. It is people who are wicked, so you might think wicked people should be killed. Yes, I suppose so. However, killing is bad. It is wicked, and I'm not a wicked witch. I'm a good witch, and I do good by turning wicked people into animals. She leant back pleased with herself and took a sip of hot water. Daniel stared at her. You mean? You changed Basil into a dog, into that lovely dog. Yes, I did. I'm so glad you liked it. I adore bulldogs, the way they snuffle and snort and those deep chests. When you take a bulldog on a ship, you have to face them upwind because their noses are so flat. It's the only way they can breathe. Of course, when I changed that dreadful baby, I was just limbering up. Wellbridge is a little damp being so low lying, and I wasn't sure how it would affect my knuckle of power. She stuck out her left hand and showed him a purple swelling on the joint. If you get rheumatism on your knuckle, it can make things very tricky. But it all went like a dream. I really did it for that pretty friend of yours. So polite. And such a nice shop her parents keep with everything higgledy-piggledy, not like those boring supermarkets. Poor children, I thought. They're going to have such a horrible evening. Yes, but you see, it's going to be much more horrible if the Boothroyds come and find Basil gone. There'd be such trouble, so please could you change Basil back if you can? If I can, said the witch, looking offended. Really, Daniel, you go too far. And actually, I was going to change Basil back in any case sooner or later, because babies aren't really wicked. To be wicked, you have to know right from wrong and choose wrong, and babies can't do that. But I cannot believe that the Boothroids wouldn't rather have the little dog for a night or two. He's completely house trained, did you know? Honestly, Miss Tembury Smith, I'm sure they wouldn't. I'm really sure. Extraordinary, said the witch, shaking her head to and fro. Well, in that case, let's see what we can do. Just wait while I change my clothes. Chapter Four Well, you seem to be right, said Hecky as they approached the towers. The dear Boothroids do not sound happy. All the lights were on and one could hear Mrs Boothroyd screams halfway down the street. Oh, poor Sumi. Now don't worry, said the witch, who had changed into her school blazer and pleated skirt. I shall pretend to be a social worker. That always goes down well. Just follow me. Inside the Boothroyd sitting room, a fat policeman was writing things in a notebook and a thin policeman was talking to headquarters on his walkie-talkie. Mrs Boothroyd was yellowing and hiccuping and gulping by turns and Mr Boothroyd was blustering and threatening to do awful things to Sumi's family. Sumi sat crouched on the sofa, her head in her hands. Between her shoes one could just see the dark wet nose of the bewildered little dog. 
Now, my dear good people, what is all this about? inquired Hecky briskly. I found this poor boy wandering about in the street quite beside himself. She pointed to the letters W-A-W -W on her blazer. I am from the Wellbridge Association for Welfare, she went on, and we cannot be doing with that kind of thing. My baby's been kidnapped, my little treasure, my bobbykins, screeched Mrs. Mrs. Boothroyd. And it's all these children's fault, roared Mr. Boothroyd. Nonsense, said Hecky. They just have got mislaid somewhere. It often happens with babies. We've searched high and low, miss, said the fat policeman. But the little bulldog had heard Hecky's voice. He crawled out from under the sofa, and as she crouched down to him, he leapt onto her lap. Who let that brute in again, raged Miss Boothroyd, and Sumi blushed and turned her head away. Dogs give you fleas, they give you worms behind the eyeballs, screeched Mrs Boothroyd. Hecky looked hard at the Boothroyds. She was angry, but she was also amazed. In spite of what Daniel had said, she hadn't really believed that they would prefer Basil to the little dog. Then she gathered up the puppy and went to the door, which Daniel was holding open for her, and out into the garden. For an animal witch, turning nice animals into silly people is much harder than the other way round. Hecky's eyes were sad as she shook off her left shoe so that her toe of transformation could suck power from the earth. Then she spoke softly to the bulldog, waiting till his tail stopped wagging and his eyes were closed. Only when he slept did she touch him with her knuckle of power and say her spells. Ten minutes later, Hecky returned to the drawing room. She had held the puppy close to her chest, but she carried Basil at arm's length like a tray. His nightdress was covered in black streaks. He was bawling, but he was quite unharmed. My lambkin, my prettykins, my darling, shrieked Mrs. Boothroy, covering him with squelchy kisses. My son, my boy, slobbered Mr. Boothroy. Where was he, miss? asked the flat, fat policeman. At the back of the coal shed, said Hecky. The obvious place to look for a baby, I'd have thought. But how did he get there? Hecky felt sorry for the fat policeman, who so much wanted to have something to put in his notebook. You want to look for a tall man with red hair, blue eyes, a black moustache, an orange anorak and purple socks. I saw him climbing over the garden wall. It'd be him who put Basil among the coals. But what would be the motive? asked the policeman with the walkie-talkie. Oh, that's easy, said Hecky. Revenge. Someone getting their own back. He'll have bought one of Mr. Boothroyd's bath plugs and found it leaked. You know what it's like when all the hot water drains away and you're sitting in an empty tub, all cold and blue with goose pimples. But when they had dropped Sumi off in the taxi, Mr. Boothroyd had been forced to pay for, Hecky turned to Daniel, looking thoughtful and serious. You know, Daniel, I shall have to change my plans entirely. I had no idea people would make such a fuss and be so unreasonable. I thought they'd come to me and say, please, Hecky, would you turn my drunken husband into a dear chimpanzee? Or we feel that Uncle Philip, who is a handbag snatcher, would do better as a two-toed sleuth that kind of thing. But now I see it isn't so. I shall have to work in the strictest secrecy. Evildoers will have to be flushed out. She peered at Daniel. Might one ask why you are snivelling? Is it because there's no one at home? Sumi's parents had been there to welcome her. But Daniel's house, as the taxi drew up, was silent and dark. Daniel shook his head. I don't mind being alone. He wiped away the tear in the corner of his eye. It's that lovely bulldog. I miss him so much. Hecky examined his face in the light of the lamp. You know, you have the right ideas. Yes, I think I might be able to use you. For I have to tell you, Daniel, that I've just had a vision. I see a band of wickedness. Hunters, 
children and witches together, uniting to rid Welbeck Bridge of wickedness. Yes, yes, I see it all. But first, dear boy, I must get myself a familiar. What a good thing that tomorrow is Sunday. Come after breakfast and we'll go to the zoo. Chapter five. When Daniel called at the shop the following morning, he found Hecky feeding her hat. After the quarrel with Dora Maybury, Hecky had crept back and gathered up her ribbon snakes and king snakes and the black mamba, and they now lived in a tank in a room behind the shop, eating boiled eggs and hissing and not being a trouble to anyone. It would have been easy for her to weave them together again and wear them on her head, but she hadn't the heart. And because she knew that Daniel was a boy who could be trusted with people's sorrows, she told him what had happened and how dreadfully she missed her friend. We had such plans, Dora and I. She was going to have a little business making garden gnomes and nice things like that, and gradually fill the park with interesting statues. Only statues of wicked people, of course. Dora was good like me. Come and see her picture. She took Daniel up to the sitting room and showed him the photo of Dora, which she had turned with its face to the wall. The stone witch with her square jaw and piggy eyes was not beautiful, but Daniel said she looked interesting, like a prize fighter. Yes, indeed, said Hecky, and sighed. And you should have seen her on the netball field, but it's all over between us. And she turned the photo back to face the wall. When they had fed the other animals in the shop, Hecky went to the larder to fetch a carrot. The carrot was about half a metre long and as thick as a thigh and scarcely fitted into the shopping basket, which was a tartan one on wheels. But Hecky said it would do for their lunch. My friend grows them for me. She's a garden witch. There's nothing she can't do with vegetables, but they do come out rather big. What I was wondering, said Daniel, as they wheeled the carrot towards the zoo, was why you need a familiar. I mean, there are animals that help witches to do magic, aren't they? And you change Basil all right without one. I don't need one, but I want one, and nothing ordinary like black cats or toads. I bet Dora's trailing round with a, bone, a bonty bot by now, at the very least. Wellbridge Zoo was small, but pretty and well kept, with flower beds between the cages. Daniel went there often because his friend Joe, whose father was a keeper in the ape house, could get him in free. Now to business, said Hecky, when they had paid and gone through the turnstile. You know what we're looking for? An animal that's fierce. Well, not so much fierce as powerful, mean, strange, and perhaps a little throbbing, that kind of thing. But the sea lions, lying about like old sofas, did not look very mean or throbbing, and nor did the giraffes with their knocked knees and film star eyes. They passed the Avery and through the cassowary, and though the cassowary looked interesting, with its flabby black wattles and dirty feet, Hecky did not think she really wanted a bird. All that flapping is not very good for magic, I've found. But when they got to the hyena pacing up and down in its cage, Hecky's face lit up. Now that is something, the way its back ends just trails away and those sinister spots and the smell. She wrote something in her notebook and they crossed over to the big enclosure which housed the kangaroos and wallabies. Great rat-coloured beasts with huge feet and mad twitchy ears, which Hecky liked enormously. Oh, I wish I was an Australian witch, she cried. Everything over there is so queer and extinct looking. The animal houses were closer together now and Hecky was running from cage to cage, as excited as a child in a toy shop. There were penguins jumping from rock to rock with their feet together like loopy waiters. There was a rusty number shoveling up ants and there was a camel in front of which she stood for a long time. It was a bull camel, tall and sneery with lumpy knees and a lower lip full of froth. 
bits of dirty straw stuck to its hump and a low rumble like thunder came from its throat. I want this camel, said Hecky. I want it terribly, but I'm going to be sensible. I'm going to be practical. I'm going to be brave. Daniel could see how hard it was for her to tear herself away from the camel. But in the reptile house, she cheered up again. It was a silent, sinister place, and every one of the animals looked as though it would help one to do magic. The crocodile smiling in its sleep, the bearded basilisk, the iguana like a shrunken dinosaur. In the ape house, they saw what seemed to be a very small ape in blue jeans, forking fresh straw onto the floor. This turned out to be Daniel's school friend, Joe, helping his father clean out the cages. Joe's mother had died when he was born and his father had reared Joe like he reared one of his orphaned apes, carrying him round in a blanket, feeding him on bottles of milk and bananas. Joe's hair was ginger like the orangutans and fell over his face. There was no tree he couldn't climb. And when anyone annoyed him, he stuck out his lower lip and glowered exactly like a gorilla. Daniel introduced him to Hecky, who was very interested to hear that his father was a keeper. Tell me, she said, are there any empty cages in this zoo? She said, spare cages in case someone was to send in some animals in a hurry, unexpectedly. Joe gave her a sharp look from under his hair and said, yes, there were. They're over by the west gate behind the tea place. He went on staring at Hecky as she talked to the monkeys and the apes. Joe understood animals almost as well as his father, and he knew that the way they came up to Hecky and laid their faces against the bars and tried to take her hand was quite out of the ordinary. Is she an animal trainer or something? he asked Daniel. And Daniel said that perhaps in a way she was. We're just have our picnic now and have a think, said Hecky, when they had been right round the zoo. Perhaps your nice friend will lend us a saw to cut up this interesting carrot. Or shall we just go across the road to the copper kettle? Daniel thought this was a good idea, and soon they were sitting at a corner table, eating cucumber sandwiches and looking at Hecky's list. Of course, the baboons are unbeatable, those red and blue behinds, her eyes glinted. But I like the orangutans too, the way their hair hangs down from their armpits. She bit into her sandwich. You notice I'm being brave about the camel? Daniel nodded and suggested the bearded basilisk. It might fit better into the flat. Yes, but reptiles are dreadfully snooty, cold-blooded, you know. Oh dear, this is so difficult. Hecky was very quiet as they wheeled the carrot back across the river and the tip of her nose had gone quite white from the strain of deciding. But in the street behind Daniel's house, she stopped and stared at a shop window. It was a do-it-yourself shop, full of tools and screws and bits of shelving. Suddenly, she hit her forehead with her hand. What an idiot I am, Daniel. What a complete fool. Why choose a familiar? Why not make one? Oh, yes, said Daniel, his eyes shining. A do-it-yourself familiar, the first one in the world. And terribly excited, they hurried back to Hecky's shop. Once she had made up her mind, Hecky wasted no time. Do you know what I'm going to make? Daniel shook his head. A dragon? Yes, honestly. Why not go for the best? A pocket dragon. Well... A bit bigger than that. Sort of between a rolling pin and a turkey in size, about the weight of a Stilton cheese. Oh, I can see him. Slightly fiery round the nostrils, you know, with green scales and golden claws. Let's get the pattern book and have a look. And that's where I'm going to leave it.